Can we keep capitalism and stop climate change? Yes, we can. My argument on climate change is that it's a time cycle. We on this planet Earth should look after our natural resources and look after the planet, there's no denying that fact, such as for example, make better use of such plastic waste rather than seeing it going into the oceans and causing damage on our marine life etc and I think that is vitally important. But there are countless myths that are being spread around by these climate change alarmists. This is basically the whole argument for my video. It's based on anti-capitalism. I think an unfair criticism made of, of Marxists that all we care about is discussing the economy and, uh, and kind of revolution and class struggles and things like that. Um, but, uh, but actually, as, as we've discussed over the course of this weekend, Marxism is, is a very broad set of ideas uh, that looks at the broader, wider questions. And, uh, and, and I think the environment, obviously, is one of the most important questions. It's the future. Of, of the planet and, and humanity. And in fact, I think we can apply a Marxist analysis to the question of the environment to help us understand uh, really the, the problem and, and the solution. And actually the, 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 the lessons we learn from actually looking at economic crises, from looking at the class struggles going on today, I think actually help us understand how to analyze and solve the environmental problems. I mean, what we can definitely see for sure so far is that capitalism really has been an completely unable to solve environmental questions. Have a listen to this. But on the latest figures I've seen, a hundred years ago, weather-related disasters killed half a million people a year. Today, it's 20,000 a year. Still 20,000 too many, but it's a reduction of 95,000. It doesn't lead to the 95%. Uh, the reduction of 95%, it does not lead to a death of billions. I mean, aren't you scaring people with this rhetoric, aren't you? I think, that, I think there's a danger of scaring people simply because we're not taking it seriously enough and people are feeling really, you know, desperate that we're heard on this. And, and unfortunately, uh, you know, alarmist language works, which is why we're, we're discussing it right now. But she basically admits that she has no evidence that billions of people are going to die in 12 years' time as a result of all of this. And Andrew Neil basically puts her in her place and she concedes that it's really all about scaring folk and, you know, it's a useful tactic to make people aware so that we can make change and do stuff. But the real agenda behind people like herself and, uh, of course, the founder of Extinction Rebellion and he conceded to it, it's a movement to overthrow capitalism and this is essentially what their entire argument is based on. Now another argument you're going to hear similar to that of global warming is on the ocean acidification. Apparently the CO2 levels etc, it's causing this acidification, seeing sea life creatures dying etc, their shells aren't able to form the same and they aren't able to adapt due to this, the higher CO2 levels and they're all going to go extinct according to these very type of people. Just have a listen to what Patrick Moore goes on to explain here on oyster population. The NRDC document also contended, quote, acidification may already be impacting marine life around the world. For example, Pacific oysters have not successfully reproduced in the wild since 2004, unquote. This is clearly not true, as in false. As Pacific <laughs> oyster production has been increasing steadily from 150,000 tons in 1950 to more than 500,000 tons in 2013. Even though most Pacific oysters are grown in aquaculture, the seed, or spat, for these operations is primarily harvested from wild breeding oysters. Patrick Moore goes on to explain that more than 500,000 years ago, CO2 levels were twice as high as they are today. Sea creatures of that time period, like the oysters, would merely harden their shells to adapt and change to the changing temperatures of the environment of that time period. There was no extinction. There's something that I want to show you adds up to everything that contradicts their entire narrative. You can see that over 550 million years that there's been consistency. I can even show you more graph evidence that you can see even from the Roman period of history, when the Roman Empire was around, the earth was hotter in that time period than it is today. And again, that evidence 
is abundantly clear. Joining us now, Phil McDuff, writer for, on economics and social policy for The Guardian. Phil, welcome to the show. Hello. Uh, glad to have you here. I recently read your piece, Ending Climate Change Requires the End of Capitalism. Have we got the stomach for it? So uh, let, let's get to the spoilers. Have we got the stomach for it? Um, I don't think we necessarily do. Um, I think part of the issue is that if, if you look at the people who oppose doing something about climate change, you have a minority of people who are the kind of the enemies, you know, the Bolsonaro's, the people who just want to burn down the rainforest because they want to burn down the rainforest, that kind of combo evil thing. And this is really what the agenda all comes down to. It's basically opposing capitalism. It's this idea that it's all capitalism's fault and therefore we need to overthrow it. Now, there are some well-meaning people out there and I'm, I've not got a problem with them because those people you know, do mean well and they want to see things improve such as, you know, the plastic waste that's in the oceans. I can reason with those people and they're scared, but you've got people like this who are trying to lead the agenda in Extinction Rebellion, are trying to scare folk with their socialist agenda because their real agenda is not about the environment. They couldn't care less about that. Think about it. See if they truthfully cared about the environment. Explain the very reason why they look at all of those socialist regimes throughout recorded history and yet they turn a blind eye to it. I mean, take for example the Soviet Union that used nuclear bombs to mine with. And if that wasn't bad enough, they then redirected the rivers due to agricultural policy that fed the Aral Sea. And by the year 1960, it became devastated so much so there was no Aral Sea left. It was once the fourth largest lake in the world and it became nothing. And that was between Uzbekistan and Kazakhstan. There was no Aral Sea left. The fishing industry of those two countries was left devastated and the land was just left contaminated. That was an example of what happened as a result of socialism. That's not to say that all of them supported the Soviet Union. This is the thing, and I've explained this many times before, there's a strong difference between that of what you have of theory and that of practice. And that's just the real world of socialism in practice. What he's calling out for ends up creating an even greater disaster to the environment. Today, you don't live under capitalism, because if you did, you'd be living under a free market economy. It's actually thanks to capitalism that's been finding solutions, you know, do stuff with the plastic waste. For example, there's been uh, some examples of the plastic being used to grind down and use in roads. They've even been trying to discover ways to make plastics edible so that, you know, if waste does go into oceans or whatever, not that you would ever want to, but it's so that it's edible, unlike the plastics that you see today. That's what the market does. The market always finds solutions to problems. Meanwhile, these people seem to think the solution is just overthrown capitalism because, <laughs> and this is the funny part, folk, I, just have a listen to this guy. And I don't quite know how the fuck we're going to sort it out, okay? So I'm going to give you some ideas about what Extinction Rebellion is doing and what I think, and then afterwards, hopefully you'll be relieved to know we're not going to have a Q&A, right? Because as I've been trying to say to people around the country, the days of Q and A's are over, right? If you want to discuss with me whether it's 1.1 degrees centigrade or 1.13 or whatever, if you have got all those technical questions, you can. I'm here all day. You can come and discuss, you know, climate sensitivity. That's not where we're at. Where we're at is we're in this total fucking crisis, right? And if we don't start to emotionally connect with that, then there's, we're going nowhere. <laughs> so this, this is the problem with these folk. People like this saying, you know, oh, forget about questions and answers. Forget about statistics, because what does that matter? We'll just go head first into everything and everything will all be fine because, you know, uh, there's going to be a complete disaster if we don't do otherwise. It was the same thing with economics. And economics applies to his argument, especially when you're talking about that of the environment, right? Socialists, as you hear them speaking about emotionally connecting, right? Everything's about emotions. The problem is, the study of economics doesn't give a toss about how you feel, right? 
It doesn't. It doesn't care. It's not a study about you know the stock market. It's not a, a study about the finances you have. Economics is a study of basically resource usage, how you can you know better improve the material wealth of the masses whilst using the fewest resources as possible to basically be efficient. Now we'll get back to that other guy's argument in a second about the forest fires but <laughs> this is the laughable thing right? If you're going to take the attitude of just going into everything head first and don't even bother thinking about it, don't even bother questioning it, don't eat <laughs> Just forget statistics. You end up with disaster. And a prime example of that was just like I explained of the starving time when you saw the pilgrims die due to starvation. What caused their starvation? Communal ownership of property. In other words, the absence of secure private property rights. That's the reason why, folk, the enclosure movement came around. That's why the periodical famines had came to an end because of the enclosure movement, because of the private ownership of land. So what's he arguing for? In the 20th century, we saw the disaster of what happened as a result of the centralisation of agriculture in 1929 when, you know, the centralised agriculture and millions died of starvation. That wasn't bad enough, you saw it in China. In 1960, more than about 40 million odd people had died due to starvation. It's all well saying, you know, on one hand, okay, we're going to overthrow capitalism. Right, so you're going to overthrow capitalism. Then what? Most of the 70 million people living in Great Britain dying of starvation? <laughs> These people are so dangerously stupid, it's unreal. He's basically saying to you, you know something? Forget facts, forget statistics, my feelings matter more than anything you could provide me with. My feelings matter more than any statistics that you can throw at me. You know, so basically forget all the evidence that you fling at me about global warming because my feelings matter more than people's own lives at risk. <laughs> <laughs> That's honestly what he's trying to say. If we just go back to that of the other argument where the guy mentions about that of the forest fires, what he's basically trying to say is that it was all because of mankind. We were the ones that caused it. Oh, we're all evil. There's been forest fires over decades and that's been something of a continuous cycle. That doesn't necessarily mean to say that it was mankind that caused it. After all, we've seen hotter temperatures back in the Roman time period. As again, you can look at that line graph evidence to see that the Earth's temperature has been declining. We're in a mini ice age. In his argument, he's basically saying that, oh, it's all the evil people. These are the people who try to say, on one hand, people are so peace-loving and we should all come together and sing Kumbaya and everything else, we'll all sing Kumbaya and come together and all live happily ever after. But at the same time, he's basically insulting people. Basically saying that we're the ones that are the cause of everything, etc, etc. Well, that's rather quite interesting. Why? There's the evidence right there, folk. You see, from 2002, even 2003, 2004, I'm pretty sure right up to about 2010, bar 2009 maybe, you see that the forest fires were far greater in those years than it was in 2019. Yet they're basing their argument off of recent forest fires in 2019. There's been a decline. Here's another line graph that you can see that basically shows you from this over a longer time period that things aren't quite made out as what these people try to make out to be. If these people ever had it their way, your life would be misery. No one denies that, of course, when there's forest fires, there's a problem and that we must look after our environment and we must, you know, seek to grow more trees and I'm all for these, you know, organisations, these charities, etc. And even things like that of the Forestry Commission seeking to grow and enhance our environment in such a way that, you know, I'm all for that. But this idea to just blame mankind when it's been a time cycle for, you know, century after century after millennia after millennia, that's the laughable part.